Um, welcome everyone to the uh, second morning session. Um, Georgina and Katie um, are past and present students of the University of Sydney. Um, by day they uh, study and uh, work at Google. By night and at weekends they teach small people, as I call them, how to program in Python and they're going to tell you all about it this morning. Katie and Georgina. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Georgina. Katie. Um, okay. So today we're going to talk about a couple of outreach programs that we run for high school students. Um, so uh, just first I'll explain briefly why I think that we need these kinds of programs. So basically uh, computing education uh, in Australia is in a rather dismal state in my opinion. So the average Australian teenager is an expert user of technology. They go on Facebook and MySpace and MSN. Um, they generally are a lot more confident with computers than their parents, um, unless possibly their parent is Peter Lovett or something like that. But, um, <laughs> Uh, and they also generally, almost always, know a lot more than their teacher about what they're, um, about programming, about computers, and they're more comfortable with experimenting. <laughs> Future student. Um, okay, so computing in high school is boring. It was enough to turn me off computing. Um, I, well, I don't need to talk about that, but basically I was never going to do any computer science at uni, um, partly because of my experience in high school. So. There's, there's one compulsory subject that every student in New South Wales does uh, in years nine and ten, in years seven and eight, and it's, it's basically, it's word processing, PowerPoint, it's like secretary skills. They even teach you to type, um, which is crazy, you know, uh, high school students type all the time on MSN or whatever. Um, and most schools don't even offer, so there are computing electives, uh, they're, they're often not taken by many students, there might be a you know, small, small number of students doing it as a bludge course because you know, if you get the computer to play the special chime then the teacher thinks it's the end of the period and you can go. Um, anyway, so we have this graph here. Uh, this is the per percentage of students in, uh, in New South Wales this year who are doing um, one of the two uh, computing related subjects. So I, I say them, they're computing related because if you uh, read the syllabus documents on the Board of Studies website, you'll realize that, um, so the thin blue wedge is software design and development. About 2% of students in the state are taught what pseudocode is. Um, and then the, the larger one, uh, IPT, that's where you learn what a database is. So in neither of these subjects, well, okay, un unless you're very lucky and your teacher um, goes beyond the syllabus, you're not really challenged. So, uh, <laughs> here we have the National Computer Science School, uh, referred to after this as NCSS. So NCSS is a 10-day residential camp for high school students, uh, generally aged 16 to 18, so they're going into year 11 or year 12. Uh, it's held at the University of Sydney, it's run by uh, faculty and student volunteers and also ex-student volunteers such as Katie and various other, in fact there are a lot of people in the audience I realise who are somehow involved in NCSS. So there's, there's two streams, there's uh, the Python programming stream and there's also a, a new stream introduced over the last few years where students um, learn a bit of C and work with Arduino boards and the iRobot Create. Um, so, if you never attended a nerd camp like this when you're in high school, it's really very hard to uh, under. It's very hard to overestimate um, how rewarding and and beneficial it is to students. So, um, I, I didn't go to NCSS. I went to a similar program for maths nerds, um, and uh, you know, for the first time, you. You go to this camp in your summer holidays because that's what you want to do because you, you love this kind of thing and you meet other people who also like it um, and that's that's incredibly uh, that's incredibly exciting and also for you know for a student who might be the only programmer at their high school or the only person who is interested in programming um, it's it's really great to meet other people that you know can be friends for life. Um, okay, so here's a quote from one of our students though. Sometimes the level of knowledge from some of the students can be intimidating and discouraging. It's good for those who are stronger to lead those who are weak, but it can be difficult at times and comparing yourself to others can be discouraging. So um, we have a very wide range of abilities at NCSS. The program is academically selective, but there's no prior programming experience required. 
So, um, so there are there are complete beginners, and there are students who have been programming since they were, you know, eight. Um, and and that can be very intimidating. Uh, it turns out that girls are less likely to have prior experience with programming. Uh, this graph demonstrates visually. Uh, so the little red thing down the bottom, that's the number, the percentage of girls doing the computing related subjects for the HSE. It's about 8%, which interestingly is less than what it is in first year uni. It's more like 20%. So there are more people coming in in first year who haven't done software, I think. Anyway, so this is why we have the girls programming network. Um, Katie and I and some of the other, some other uh, women from uh, in and around the University of Sydney run this after school activity once a week during school term. Uh, so we focus on building confidence with Python and other things. So here um, some of these, some of our girls are taking apart and hopefully putting back together some computers that we gave them. Um, they did all work afterwards, it was great. Um, okay. So the third program to talk about is the NCSS Challenge. This is by far the largest of the, um, of the outreach programs. It's an online programming competition that's designed to teach, uh, teach students to program while they compete. Um, there are, it runs for five weeks in August, so this is the third week at the moment. Um, so, you know, somewhere in the state, there will, or it, it, it's open to students from all over Australia. So all over Australia at the moment there are about 2,000 students who are enrolled in this and some of them will be, uh, I don't know, it, possibly sitting up the back of their classrooms pretending to, I don't know, do whatever, but they're working on this. Okay, so they submit their code to our system. Uh, Tim will talk about this later in the next talk. There's Tim. Um, and in addition to automatic feedback, so the system says right, wrong, pass, fail, you pass some of the tests or whatever, um, students can also ask for help in forums or they can message tutors thr through the site. So the tutors are generally um, uh, volunteer uni students and some of them are here now. Okay, so Katie will talk about why we want to use Python, I think, as a, as a teaching language. Okay. Um. Yeah, so I'm going to go through why we chose Python to be the primary teaching language of all three of these different initiatives. Um, what we found to be really good about using Python as a teaching language, what we found that sucks about using Python as a teaching language, um, and some of the challenges that are faced generally with teaching programming to beginners. Um, so to start off with, I'm going to talk about Hello World, because, you know, how hard can it be? This is a screenshot of the NCSS Challenge website and the first question of the beginner course and I think of the intermediate course as well is hello world. So pretty much, if you can see the tiny text there, I can zoom in a bit more, um, you are expected to write this line. And of course, um, I'm gonna show you a series of code samples and all of these samples are things that students have submitted for this question. Okay including this one. <laughs> um, and you might think, okay, it's Python, it's not like Java, how hard can it be to write Hello World as a beginner programmer, right? Hey, in Java you've got like 101 different things you can screw up. But in Python, you know, maybe there's a limited set of things that you can screw up. So maybe you don't really get that you have to type print, you just wanna type Hello World because in the interpreter you can just say Hello World and it will print hello world sort of, maybe if you put it in quotes. Um, they don't really get what print is, they use brackets, that actually works, um, but maybe they've got the wrong idea. Um, a lot of students who have done Visual Basic at school will try to put first, cap uh, first letter capitalized on everything, um, and some students kind of print out what the interpreter said exactly. Um, it's probably worth noting that each question has a set of notes associated with it. For this particular question, the notes tell you pretty much exactly how to do the question. Um, but even then, some students really just don't get it. Um, in this case, we've got, <laughs> I don't know what's going on in the first one. Uh, the second one, the student probably typed it in, in Microsoft Word and it did smart quotes. So that screws that up. Um, raw input does actually print hello world, but of course the, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't complete because it's still waiting for input. Um, then, you know, 
as you can see at the bottom, some students get really, really frustrated. They can see that the question will be easy, but they're still not passing the tests because programming is hard. And then you get other students who like to show off. <laughs> this student, I think, comes from a Java background based on the, the new function and the Hello World factory. But again, this is something a student submitted. Um, so on the whole, we find that on average, the students really love Python. Particularly the students have done a little bit of programming somewhere else before. They really appreciate Python um, and some of the things about it. For example, multiplying strings. Um, we find that Python is good because you can start small. So for example, Hello World is actually really simple. Um, and getting simple programs up and running uh, requires very little code. Uh, which is great, but it's also a language that can grow big. So it can grow with the student's experience and knowledge. So you can start off programming in Python and know that you can build really cool, really big things and that it's a real language that people are using in the world. So you might find that in high school, lots of students complain that they don't understand why they're doing maths. So we wanted to avoid that by saying this is a real programming language and real skills that you could use in a job. Um, that you can use to build cool things and that people have done that. Um, typing speed was something that surprised me in teaching lots of students. Some of the students really suck at typing. They type very slowly and it's distracting when, you're having, when you have to type. When you focus, like if you, for someone who can type really well, typing doesn't require any thought. And the students that can type better learn programming faster because they're thinking about the programming and not about the typing. Having a language that's minimalist, which involves as little typing as possible, um, is a real advantage to a teaching language. Um, also when you're doing beginner programs, uh, string manipulation is usually one of the things that you learn be first because it's simple, you, you know, here is the string that comes in, I'll create another string that goes out, um, and Python has a really rich set of tools for string manipulations. Plus the interpreter, um, Sometimes it takes a lot of prodding to get the students to play around in the interpreter, but once they do, they can find they find that really helpful. Um, but then again, Python also has some disadvantages, which makes it difficult for students to learn. Um, this is again a quote from a student who found NCSS to be a little bit difficult, um, and. There are, um, Peter Lovett did a great job of going through a lot of the pitfalls that beginner programmers um, find in Python. Invisible types, I think, is one of the biggest. Um, so it's really great when you already know about variables and you already know about types to not have to you know, worry about declaring all of your types. But when a student is really stuck because they can't add a string and an integer and they don't know what a string and an integer are, um, that can be really difficult for them. Um, we find that uh, sometimes it's hard to get students motivated about doing plain text things, particularly to start off with. Uh, we have done uh, teaching uh, web development with Python um, so that you get some you know, visual interfaces that you can do, um, but that requires extra knowledge about HTML and CSS and possibly even JavaScript, um, and that's a much bigger learning curve. In the same way, most of the graphics tools that uh, you can use with Python have an extra learning curve on top of basic programming skills that we found. We have been um, experimenting with teaching newbie students uh, uh, visual interactive programs with Pygame and stuff, um, but again, that has a sharper learning curve. Um, we find also that the students, if they don't know what function to use in a particular circumstance, maybe they don't know about the split function on strings, they just get stuck. They don't know where to find things. Um, we point them to the help in Python, but again, that might require a, uh, essentially knowledge of a whole other language to understand what the help is trying to tell you. Um, and uh, discovering things can be a bit tricky. So often you need to have tutors around with the students in the same room so that they can help them find things that they, they need. And eventually students get to the point where they go, hmm, I want to do X. This seems like something that Python should be able to do. And then they know to go look for things. But that's a, that's a step that they have to reach before they can start programming on their own. Um, and of course, the last thing is we generally use idle. Um, because it comes as a default install. There's nothing extra that you need to install. Um, but idle sucks in various ways. Um, so if anyone has really good 
um, examples of IDEs that would be good for newbie programmers, I would love to hear it. Um, so this, this section is more about the challenges that face uh, teaching programming in general, not necessarily specific to Python. This is uh, on the first day of NCSS where we had a surprisingly successful tower building competition where you had to have a stuffed toy at the top of the tower. Um, you can see a, a one-up mushroom at the top there. Um, so one of the biggest challenges is students are really busy these days. They have school, they have all these extracurricular activities. Getting to a class um, is a big ask. Going to a 10-day summer camp is a big ask. Um, so having the time and motivation and to do that uh, is one of the challenges. Um, support and community is something that we found to be really important and really helpful. Uh, this is, a, again, a quote from a student at NCSS. Um, I, he or she um, hadn't done any programming before, but decided that he or she liked Python um, because of the support that they'd gotten at NCSS, um, not for any other reason. Um, so that is something that's really important for fostering new programmers. Um, and one issue that we've struck is the hurdle of installing and using Python um, on one's own computer, which is um, an important milestone to be coding um, at home. We've tried installing Python on the government issued laptops to high schoolers, but they are extremely locked down and you can break them, but then they might lose the, um, but we can't ask students to do that because then they might lose access to their laptop um, because if they get caught, it would be bad. Um, so we haven't been able to find any way to following all of the rules and guidelines install Python on any of the laptops. So we're looking at options for running Python in the browser. So we, if you check out either of these links, um, uh, if you have more in, uh, questions, you probably want to ask Tim Dorban after the next talk. Um, so one of those is CPython compiled into JavaScript, which runs a bit slowly, but it works. Um, and TryPython is built on Iron Python, and that seems to be a better option at the moment. Um, one of the other hurdles to get over is confidence. This is the same quote that Georgina had up before. Um, we find that because there is no standardization of teaching of programming, there is vastly different skill levels in the same age group. So you might have students who are already, um, when I started at university, there were some students who were already working part-time. Um, one, one friend who was working part-time for Portugal Telecom on a Python app, no less. Um, and I had done a little bit of programming at school and I thought that I was pretty good when I was at school, but when I got to uni, it was very intimidating discovering that everyone else knew far more than I did. Um, and that can be really difficult. Um, so uh, we're aiming to try and level the playing field a bit more by focusing uh, on newbies. But generally speaking, um, the students, <laughs> you might have met Sasha already, um, the students uh, really, uh, Sasha is actually a, a previous NCSS student and a previous Girls Programming Network student um, and is now a tutor and is now a PyCon. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, generally, the students really like um, learning to program and they really have a, a great time learning Python and every year there are some people who start out with absolutely nothing and pick it up and learn to enjoy it and go on to study it at university and that's always really exciting to see. Um, so this is sort of the general impression that we get that uh, students like Python. Um, and that it you know, helps teach good programming concepts. Um, and in conclusion, um, we teach Python at high school because generally the level of teaching um, of Python in high, of, of, of programming in general in high school is pretty shocking, to be honest. Um, we think we're already doing a really good job of supporting students by providing a community um, and programming experience for the students who already know a little bit about programming. Um, but we need to focus more, and this not, doesn't just go for Sydney Uni and NCSS, but in general, we need to focus more on the students who start out with nothing because that is a really difficult barrier of entry and we're not going to get more computer scientists and programmers to meet the future demand unless we focus on the people who don't already know how to program um, when we're, we're teaching and providing communities. So that is it. Um, if you want to find out more, there's 
uh, mine and Georgina's contacts, and the NCSS site has a information about all three of the different programs. Thank you. Um, we do have time for questions. Um, not so much a question, but more just pointing out that um, there are things like uh, movable Python and portable Python. There are Python that is that's designed to be on a. Oh, oh, <laughs> sorry, yep, sorry. Um, it, so what they actually do, the the DET laptops won't run anything that isn't on the C drive. You can't put anything there. You can't do. You just can't. Um, they don't even have, it's not just Python, they don't have any um, uh, other programming languages installed either. Um, this is the digital education revolution and it's just, <laughs> it's frustrating <laughs> that it's so ignorant and da. So yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You mentioned Silverlight, oh, so you mentioned mm. uh, TryPython, so they can't even install plugins, is that correct? Uh, yeah. So Silverlight is already installed on oh, okay. the DET laptops. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I believe Internet Explorer is the only browser that they can use. That's also true. <laughs> <laughs> can, they, can they boot up the CD or are you... No. 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 I think there's, a really angry, um, there's a really angry sticker on the back uh, over the hard disk bay, which is like, you know, do not do this. Or... If you open this laptop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they all have GPS tracking as well, um, which I guess is a good thing. This is the magical talk screen. <laughs> what are your favourite examples, like small examples, to motivate kids to actually, you know, that, that programming can be productive and exciting, like that you give them to, to show them that? Um, generally, I'd recommend actually checking out the NCSS challenge. Um, so a lot of the questions there, uh, the, we phrase the questions in funny ways, but there really isn't a lot that you can do when you're trying to write questions which only have if statements and no loops and no lists and no dictionaries and nothing really. Um, so that is a challenge to find interesting questions that are good for, for beginners. Um, but the, the, the challenge questions get all the way up to um, things like writing a small virtual machine and using regular expressions and reverse Polish notation parsing and um, when you, the, yeah, there's a not, uh, we, we try to make them as fun as possible, um, but I can't think of like a particularly good example of an easy question. So at NCSS, the, um, in the Python stream, we get them to build a, a web app. So for, for a few years, um, they built a, a search engine. Um, it's but not cool anymore. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Google is so, you know, back then. Um, now, now they build a social networking site um, yep. uh, running on Tornado. And I, I think that's kind of cool because you can divide it up into a group of students and everyone can do something. So there's, there's yeah, yeah, different aspects. It's pretty interesting. Um, a pretty interesting challenge as a, a group leader or as a tutor at NCSS to get a group of about 12 to 13 high school kids, some of whom have never programmed before, to together build one web app. Um, and I'm always really impressed with the results at the end of, and this is only in five days, because um, we spend the first half of the camp teaching Python and then the second half building this social networking site. Um, so I'm always really impressed with the, the quality of the work that's turned out. I mean, sure, it's buggy, but Wow, it's built by students in five days. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep, this one. Oh, okay. Um, and do you have any statistics on the outcomes of, um, at the end of a computer science degree uh, of your National Computer Science Summer School graduates compared to people who haven't gone through that program? Huh. Are they more successful? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't think those statistics would be particularly helpful. Um, mostly because NCSS has a massive selection bias. Mm -hmm. So we're already choosing the students who are enthusiastic about programming. Most of them have programmed before when they're in high school. So I don't think it would be fair to compare the success of those students to the success of other students who d weren't at that state when they were in high school. Um, that being said, I don't know. I think... Well, neither of us went to NCSS. And 
We turned out pretty well, I hope. <laughs> Um, but if you want to... intimidating in first year where, where everyone else is wearing the NCSS tip. Well, not, sorry, not everyone else, but there's, there's a select group of people that all hang out together. They already know each other when they get to uni. They're all wearing matching t-shirts um, <laughs> and they talk about Python in their spare time. But, you know, you can get over that after a few weeks and it turns out they're not that weird. Or <laughs> maybe I got weirder. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I guess just a small thing, you could try maybe uh, going in through the smartphone because you can get Python on Android now and there's, mm -hmm. it's not completely fair because not everyone's going to have access but you don't necessarily need their laptops to get Python in front of them. Um, I think even when you're programming for a mobile device, programming on a computer is a lot easier mostly because typing on a mobile device usually sucks um, or at least sucks a lot more than a standard QWERTY keyboard. Um, so I don't know how helpful that would be, but we have done uh, in, G in GPN a bit of Android development. Um, but yes, you're right. It is then your barrier changes from having a laptop which they can install things on to having an Android device. Um, and it is really exciting for the students to be, you know, programming little Android apps. Um, but I don't know if that would have much advantage over uh, what we're currently doing. Um, hi, uh, I'm here from uh, Los Angeles, and I, I was wondering, so I, I'm really excited about what you're doing both with Girls Programming Network and NCSS, and I would, uh, in particular, I really like the, um, the online interface where you can, um, where students can work on their own until they get it right, mm -hmm. and I was wondering uh, if you had any ideas about how to bring either these programs or similar ones to the US and like what someone like me could could do? Um, that is kind of a personal goal of mine. This is not really part of the, the initiatives, but um, to have a set of Python teaching resources online and available for anyone to use. Um, I don't know, I can't comment on what future plans of the NCSS challenge are. Um, I don't know if you yeah, know. We, we're not we're not exactly the main organizers of that particular one, so you can talk to us afterwards and we can we can get you in contact with other people. Yeah. Uh, there's another question? Um, you mentioned at the start of the talk um, that one of the biggest problems in computer science education is that none of the teachers really have any computer science background. Is there anything that the National Computer Science School is looking at doing to educate teachers on how to educate students? Um, so this is probably something we should have mentioned. Uh, every year at NCSS we have, we invite teachers to come as well. So um, unfortunately very few teachers actually take us up on that. Uh, usually every year we have maybe two or three, uh, maybe five teachers if we're lucky, um, who come to NCSS and learn alongside the kids um, programming in Python. Um, and the feedback we've got from those teachers has been really good. They feel like they've learnt a lot and they enjoy it as well. Um, uh, James Curran, who's the, the organiser of NCSS, um, has run in the past uh, teacher training courses, so teaching teachers to use Python. Um, and... <laughs> um, but... Again, things have gotten busy and that hasn't that's sort of fallen off the radar. Um, but that is definitely something that we want to do. It is difficult to get teachers to take ex their, usually their own time out to go to extra training courses um, for things. There are also teachers. Sorry. There are also teachers registered for the NCSS challenge, and some of them get really into it and participate on the forums and and answer other students' questions and ask questions and do the problems themselves, which is great. Yeah. Um, but not all of them. Sometimes the most amusing attempts at answers come from the teachers. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Any more questions? We've got time for one more. Okay. M maybe with the teachers you can maybe deploy it on the web or something, you know, so... Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, well, if they're time poor, I mean, they work their butts off in general and it's hard to actually get to Sydney or time away from work. Yes. Um, you know, maybe you could like package certain sections of the um, NCS stuff so that they can, you know, sit down for an hour or two and actually get skilled up. Yep. 
So that is part of what we're trying to do with the challenge by um, encouraging teachers to uh, attempt the questions themselves. But the challenge, uh, you're right, the challenge only does run for five weeks in a year. Um, and while they can access the problems and keep attempting them um, for the entire year after that, um, it might be good, a good idea to have something that's available all the time. Yeah. All right, and with that one, I'm afraid we're out of time, but uh, thank you very much to Casey and thank Georgina. You. Thank you.